So now we're coming to a point in this course where we're, we're talking about a transition from one period to another period. The way that Blankensop talks about this is he calls, it, he calls it between the old order and the new order. Essentially, we're talking about the 6th century BC. We know that the 6th century is equivalent to the 500s. So during the 500s BC, we have a lot going on in the ancient Near East. After four years of independence, we were independent for 400 years. We had our monarchs, beginning with people like King Saul, and then King David and King Solomon, who built up the temple. And we were a people for 400 years, but then after that, we became a vassal to three different empires, first to Assyria, then to Egypt, and then to Babylon, where we were taken in exile. The Babylonians, when we were in, when we were in exile in Babylon, they allowed us to, to settle together, which was a good thing, because what happened when we settled together? That meant that we were able to preserve a bit of who we were. We were able to tell stories at night around the fire of how things used to be. When we were deported, I sometimes use the analogy of it's sort of like the Oklahomans coming in and deporting us to Mexico. The question arises, how far were we deported from our homeland? Were we, departed, say, from, were we deported, say, from Austin to San Marcos, some 30 miles? We were actually deported more than 1,000 miles from our home. So to give us some reference, what are some cities that are 1,000 miles away? Phoenix, Arizona is 1,000 miles away. Imagine being deported by, to Phoenix, Arizona in an age before airplanes or automobiles or trains. Cities that are 1,100 miles away include Chicago, that's 1,100 miles away. Orlando is 1,100 miles away. San Luis Potosí, 1,100 miles away. Imagine being deported to any one of those cities back in an era in which we don't have the transportation that we have today. So it raises various questions. First of all, we were deported from our homeland and we had to leave, so we went and settled together that far away. But then after 70 years of living that far away, when they say that we can go back to our homeland, you know, you've got to ask yourself, it's pretty nice here in Phoenix, or in Orlando, or in San Luis Potosí, wherever we find ourselves exiled. Do we really want to go back to Austin, to, where, to that place where our city and our temple were destroyed? So the Babylonians, they allowed us to settle together in our exile. And though prophecy didn't come to an end during the exile, but it was profoundly transformed. Because before, what happened was the prophets were tied to the kings, so that in the pre-exilic times, where did we find the prophets? They were prophesying to the kings. What happens when all the kings are deported and are no longer kings? We don't have any kings. So the prophets are not going to be found with the kings, and so prophets are going to take on a different role. So we're going to Essentially, that's why we break the prophets into three different periods, which is why we refer to the book of the prophet Isaiah being divided into three parts. What are the three parts? Before the exile, during the exile, and then after the exile. What do we call those three books of Isaiah? The first book of Isaiah we call Proto-Isaiah. The second one is Deutero-Isaiah, and the third is Trito-Isaiah. We want to keep those terms in mind because when we come to one of the last prophets this evening, we're going to be talking about Zechariah, the book of the prophet Zechariah. How interesting. Zechariah could be divided into three parts as well. What are we guessing we're going to call those three authors? Proto-Zechariah, Deutero-Zechariah, and Trito-Zechariah. So that we sort of separate. We know that it's one book now, but we know that it was written by at least two, if not three different people. So prophecy is going to change because when you no longer have kings then, the prophets are going to be aligned with them, so we're going to have prophets having a different role during these times. So first let's set forth the context of all that was happening in the ancient Near East during that time that was influencing prophecy. Unfortunately, the 60 crucial years from the first deportation... So when we're talking about the 500s, in the year 598, which almost opens the 6th century BC, that's when the first deportation occurs. And we, we say the first deportation is what's going to happen is people are going to be deported in cycles, which is why it's so difficult to say how many years we were in exile. It depends on which cycle you were deported as part of. So the first people are going to go into exile in 598, 
We're going to see that some of the first people to go into exile were many of the leaders, because once we take away the kings and the priests and the prophets, the leaders, then we don't have to worry about those people so much. So the first people for us to get rid of, to take care of, are going to be the leaders. Let's get rid of them in the first cycle of deportation. So from there until 538, and the question is what happens in 538, Cyrus, the king of the Persians, so we'll say Cyrus of Persia, allows us to go back home. So during these 60 years, the sad part is that we don't have a lot of historical documents during that time. We don't have a lot of people writing books or records or anything telling us what was happening and going on at that time. We get the impression, though, from the Book of Lamentations and other, and other sources, though, that there was widespread destruction and disruption and depopulation, simply meaning that when you start deporting people and telling people that they have to leave their homes and leave the city, that's going to disrupt people's lives for quite a while. Imagine Oklahoma coming in and telling the people of Austin, you all got to go, you're out of here, off to San Luis Potosí. That's going to disrupt the lives of many people. And that's the, the distance of the deportation? That's right. 1100 the first time? Over a thousand miles. Can you imagine walk. the time that it takes to, to walk, walk or to travel over a thousand miles? If we were told that we were deported to San Luis Potosí or going north to Chicago, that's, we're not going to be in Chicago tomorrow. The Edomite encroachments, so we realized that on the coast it was Previously, Israel, or Ephraim, we called it, in the north. And in the south was Judah. What was the capital of Judah? The capital of Judah was Jerusalem. So Israel was taken care of first, and then we were taken care of, meaning sent off into exile after that. But what happened was that the Edomites, now that we're gone from our land, is anyone protecting our borders? Not so much, which means that the Edomites, the people of Edom, are going to be encroaching on our land. Do you remember who the father of the Edomites was? We remember that Abraham had two sons, one legitimate and one less so. So he had his concubine Hagar. What was their son's name? Abraham and Hagar had a son named Ishmael. And who was, the, who was Abraham's wife? Sarah. And their son was... She laughed because she was so old. She laughed, and she laughed in Hebrew means Isaac. Isaac, then, is the father of all Jews and Christians. All of us trace our roots back to Isaac. Who traces themselves back to Ishmael? Muslims. And the Muslims, then, these, this, the tribes of Ishmael, then, were located in Edom, which simply means that now that Edom is encroaching on our area, that helps to explain why it is that we came up with stories like the story of Jacob stealing his brother Esau's blessing. I want to apologize right now. It wasn't Ishmael who was in Edom. It was actually Esau who was seen as being, uh, his descendants as being in Edom. So when we tried to explain to our children why it was that we didn't like the Edomites, what was the etiological explanation that we gave them? The reason that we gave them was because back in the days of old, Esau was supposed to get his father Isaac's blessing. But who really got the blessing? We did. Ooh, follow that? We got the blessing which has made us enemies ever since. Esau's descendants then were seen as the people of Edom who were encroaching on our territory. After the fall of Jerusalem, then, the Babylonians are going to appoint a native governor, Gadaliah, who's going to take up residence in Mitzpah. So Jerusalem is destroyed. What they're going to do is they're going to destroy our, our capital and our temple. So he's not going to be in our capital, Jerusalem. He's actually going to set up another capital, which is going to be about seven miles north. Gadaliah... <coughs> Is, was sympathetic to Jeremiah, whom we studied last week, which leads us to believe that he belonged to the peace party during the reign of King Zedekiah. But this Gedaliah, who set up the government seven miles north of Jerusalem, was later assassinated during a failed revolt by Ishmael, not to be confused with this Ishmael centuries earlier. Another revolt led by another Ishmael, a member of the royal family, which led to the deportation 
and the reassigning of lands. That is to say, so long as the people are getting along here and are paying us our tributes and are being loyal, we don't have to worry about them so much. But if there's an uprising in the land, then we're going to take care of business. And so when Ishmael led a revolt, then that led to more uh, deportations. Conflict ensued between the natives and between second and third generation Babylonians when they were allowed back. So let's think about it for a moment. So we're deported a thousand miles away. What's going to happen when we're finally allowed back? Of all of us in the room, we're going to be looking around the room and asking one another, are you going back? I'm not sure if I'm going back. Are you going back? That's a long ways. I mean, would, how many would actually have remembered the trip if it were 60 years before? Follow me. Anyone in this room? Imagine if the exile were 60 years ago. Were any of us over 60 in this room? Any of us who are over 60 in this room, you can imagine how old you were 60 years ago. That would have been your age. 60 years ago would have been your age at the time of the exile. Now you've got to think to yourself, okay, how much do I really want to go back to that place from which I was exiled at that age? So a lot of people didn't end up going back. Those who did end up going back, the question now becomes, what do we do? Because now there's this conflict between these people who are coming back, second or third generation Babylonians, we'll call them, and the natives of the land, those who are still here. Why do we say that they were second or third generation Babylonians? Because those of us who are exiled, it's not that we're coming back. It's more our children and our grandchildren who are going to be thinking, okay, are we going back to our native land? or to our parents or grandparents in native land. When they were allowed back in, the, the, those, the people who were here, the word that we often use was the anawim, or the poor of the land, were already here. And so the anawim who remained claimed that the deportees who were now coming back were expelled from the community. So essentially the anawim were saying, we are God's special people. And what were the deportees who were coming back saying? We are the special people. The deportees likely appealed to Leviticus chapter 25. Why? Because Leviticus chapter 25 verse 23 says that when you have, when you have a right to, to inherit the land, that is your right. That can't be taken away from you. And so they believed that they had a right to this land. This was their ancestors' land. The other word we use for these people who are, who are dispossessed and moved off into exile, are, we, call, we refer to them as the Jews of the di Diaspora. Have we heard of the Diaspora before? There are a few Diasporas that happen in history. The next Diaspora after this is going to happen in 70 AD. When the temple is destroyed again, Jews are dispersed. And that dispersion of Jews we know of as the Diaspora. So these Jews who were off in exile and now coming back are also known as the Jews of the dispersion or the Jews of the diaspora. So the question now becomes, who does Judah and who does Jerusalem belong to? To the Anawim, to the natives, or to those who are coming back? Can you see the fights that are going to happen? When people start coming back and saying, this used to be my parents' or grandparents' home, other issues included foreign marriages. Why would foreign marriages be a problem? Because if we're exiled off into Babylon and we're among other peoples, then it's only natural that our children, who are going to speak a little less of our language and more the language of the Babylonians, that they're going to be looking around and winking, that our, that our sons are going to be winking at the Babylonian girls, or that our daughters are going to be winking at the Babylonian boys, and what's going to be happening? There's going to be from intermarrying. Inbreeding, I think I heard, right? That's going to be what's happening. Why is that a problem for us as Jews? Because we're all concerned about being holy. What does the Hebrew word holy mean in English? Set apart. We as Jews are set apart. We don't marry them. We're called to be holy, to be pure. Ooh, follow me. What's going to happen now? If my child marries a Babylonian... Will our race continue to be pure? So intermarriage was a problem, and also syncretist worship. 
Syncretism is a word we've heard before. What is syncretism? When you take two different religions, elements of two different religions, and bring them together, the thing that results is something new that's not one religion or the either. When Jews go off to Babylon, or in the middle of the Babylonian religion, what's going to happen? Elements of our religions are going to mix. What are some examples of that? We heard two weeks ago the story of Noah and the ark. What did we, do we remember from that Sunday? Where did, we, where did we hear that? Is that a story that we invented here in Jerusalem or in Judah? No. That's a story that they invented in the place of our exile. Interesting. That was a Babylonian flood myth, a Babylonian flood story that we heard. Oh, that's a pretty cool story. Mm. And we made the story our own, and we brought that story with us back to Jerusalem. Most prophets from this period support the diaspora Jews, those Jews, those Jews who were exiled, as the heirs of the old Israel. So it's interesting because some of them, like Jeremiah, says that the good figs are the ones who were deported. Haggai condemned their opponents as ritually defiled, essentially saying, he too is saying, these are the true Israelites, and those who oppose them are ritually defiled. Which is why there's going to be this, in the time of Jesus even, this conflict is going to continue, because Jesus is going to take the side of whom? Of the poor and of the anawim, the dispossessed, the people of the land. We know very little about the religious life in Judah during the loss of independence because what's going to happen is once our capital and our temple are destroyed, then those who remain here are going to continue on with some semblance of religion, but it's not going to be the same. The temple's destroyed. Do you remember what happened in the time of Josiah? In the time of Josiah, we had many mountains and hills where we had shrines and temples. Was that cool with Josiah? What did Josiah say? No. Get rid of all of those shrines and altars. There's going to be one place for God. Where's that going to be? In Jerusalem. Now that the temple is destroyed, though, what are the people in this area going to do? We're going to go back to worshiping our gods on different hills and in different places with different shrines. So some cultic activity could have continued in the area of the temple, as suggested by Jeremiah. But, despite the prohibition in the book of Deuteronomy, the worship of Yahweh is likely going to be continuing in other places. Before, when we had the temple, we came to the temple to worship Yahweh. Now that there is no temple, then why not worship Yahweh in other places? So long as we have the temple in Jerusalem, we also had seven categories of cult personnel, which means what in sing simple English? There were seven, seven employee groups around the temple, ranging from the priests to the temple servants. Um, what happens when you no longer have a temple? Those people are unemployed. So what happened to those seven categories of employees during this period? We're not quite sure. But we know that 60 years later, when we came back, that they were able to, we were able to create this structure again in Jerusalem, which leads us to believe that they never died out. So it's possible that they took up residence in some other place, at some other temple, say, like in Casiphia. Or it's possible that their job changed during those 60 years. Maybe instead of being centered at the temple, maybe they were out more in, in communities, like St. Paul. Right? St. Paul didn't go to the temple to preach. He went into people's homes. Maybe during this time, it's these people, maybe these priests and these people who worked at the temple before had fulfilled other jobs, if you will. They taught or preached in other ways. It seems that the Babylonian Jews, those who were exiled, supported the Persians because what's going to happen when, we're, when we are allowed to come back, when Cyrus allows us to come back to Jerusalem, who's going to be in charge of the temple? The Babylonian Jews. So how interesting. It almost suggests that Cyrus is thinking, I'll let you all go home and I'll give you control of the temple so that you, you can rebuild your society there so long as you are obedient to me. Cyrus, king of Persia. I'll let you rebuild. I'll even help you to rebuild your temple so long as you are obedient to me. 
Traditional prophecy was likely losing the battle against the allure of Babylonian magic and divination and dream interpretation. Remember again, when we were off in exile in Babylon, we're mixed with other religions, and so we're going to see other people in their culture doing different, right? We're going to see the palm readers and the fortune tellers and the tarot card readers of their society, and there are going to be certain people among us who frankly, are going to be turning to them from time to time, right? Jeremiah and Ezekiel bracket their prophecy with divination. Ezekiel shares a polemic against women prophets or prophetesses. He talks about them wearing shawls and tying bands around their clients' wrists while pronouncing spells. So he sort of gives this image of how it was that he wasn't the only prophet in town. He was competing against others who had these rituals, for instance, when you went to one of these women prophets, according to the Ezekiel, the image he gives you is that, that, that this prophetess would tie your hands and would put on her shawl and would begin doing her thing. She began doing her thing. We'd already talked about how it was that pre ezekiel prophecy was tied to the monarchy, to the kings, and so with the loss of the monarchy then, how it is that prophecy declined, but also, there's another shift during this time that with our contact with the Babylonians, the Babylonians are writing things down, like their Enuma Elish, their flood stories, for instance. They were writing all of these things down. What was the difference with us up until this time? Were we writing things down? We were just saying things. The prophets would come and, sell, and say things, which is why when we saw how the Babylonians wrote things down, what did we start to do? We started to write things down. What were some of the things that we started to write down? What are the first five books of the Bible? The Pentateuch. We started to write these things down. Wow, this is how we're going to preserve our holiness, our purity, being among this other people. We're going to write these stories of who we are and where we come from and these rules for how we're going to live together. About 600 BC. First written down. Why is that interesting? Because there are going to be certain books, like the book of Genesis. We know, for instance, that the book of Deuteronomy is going to be the first scroll that's discovered. The first scroll that's discovered, we've talked about that before, during the reform of King Josiah. He decided to start a reform, and five years later, they discovered the book of Deuteronomy. So we have that book, but the other books that are part of the Pentateuch, for instance, the book of Genesis, that's going to talk about events that happened some... Say with, with uh, Abraham, around 800, 1800 B.C., Moses, somewhere around, say, 1200 or 1150 B.C., the monarchy of David around 1000 B.C., all of these events that took place centuries before, we're now going to start writing down the stories. Were we writing down the stories as they took place? When we read the book of Genesis, was that written when Abraham was walking this earth? That was written a long time later. We dare say some 1,200 years later. Can you imagine writing a book about something that happened 1,200 years ago? That's a long time ago. But it's our contact with the Babylonians who are writing things down, which makes us think, wait a minute. We can, they write down their stories so that people can read them. If we were to write down our stories and our laws, then we'd be able to share them with others too. So, is it correct to say that we already knew how to write? We meaning we as Jews, or we as human beings? So, human, human writing was being invented around this time, and it's simply, I, I'm, I, would, I, would, I would dare say that when we're off in exile, that that's something that we're learning from other people. Look at that. We've just been talking to one another all this time. Just imagine if we learned to write things down. I could write down the, the things that I have to go shopping for rather than having to remember them. Oh. Okay, maybe it was a different era back then. It's not coming from the Greeks. No, it was not coming from the Greeks. It's coming here in the, in the, in the ancient Near East. Hmm. What was their language? Excellent question. So there were various there were various tribes and peoples, of course, throughout here. So when you, for instance, when you hear the Phoenician alphabet, the Phoenicians, of course, were one group of peoples living in this part of the world at this time, who were ones who were 
figuring out okay how to take how to take the sounds that they were speaking and writing them down. The Phoenicians, the Babylonians. It'd be interesting to see what language they were speaking. Was it some form of Sumerian? It would be interesting to know what what the Babylonians were speaking at that time. Did they call it? It would be interesting to know. Isn't the modern day alphabet like so more or less that's right. That's right. The English alphabet is based on the Phoenician alphabet. It's essentially saying that we take sounds and we give each sound a, a symbol. Is it the same in Chinese? No, very different, right? They have different symbols, and if you look at the symbol, you have no idea how to pronounce it. If you look at Spanish, you there are certain rules that say this this letter makes this sound. Oh, okay. So that's what these people were doing back in this age. They're learning how to write, which means that once we learn how to write, what does that give us the, the power to be able to do? To start recording the stories that they're telling. Before it was just Deacon John telling us these stories around the campfire at night. But now that I've learned to write, I can say, Deacon John, tell us another story. And as he's telling the story, I can be capturing this story in writing. Wow. So imagine the story. Deacon John's a good storyteller. Imagine the stories we're going to be capturing. Which is why when we start writing down a book like the, the uh, book of Genesis, do you remember back to our introduction to, the, to Scripture? We were talking about various sources. We were talking about J and P, for instance, in the book of Genesis. How was that? We can tell that different people wrote different parts of the book of Genesis. Well, some of those writers, for instance, the J that we referred to is the Yahwist writer. How interesting that during this time, the priestly classes, of course, the priests were, were, say, a bit more educated than the people of the land, right? So these priests had different groups, the Yahwist writers, the priestly writers, the Eloist writers. They were all different priestly writers, if you will, different classes of writers who were writing stories. And what's fascinating is that when we start reading the book of Genesis, we can tell the difference between them based on the words that they use. Some of them will use one word for God, Elohim. Others will use other words for God, Yahweh. Oh, wait a minute. Are they talking about the same God? We come to the conclusion, we say that they were talking about the same God, but these people were talking about Yahweh, and these people were talking about Elohim. Yes, ma'am. Um, el tiempo de los profetas... Vivieron por el mismo tiempo en diferentes tiempos. En diferentes tiempos. They lived in different times. Entonces, quiere decir que ellos interpretaban los sueños, interpretaban su, lo que ellos creían y era lo que escribían, era lo que explicaban. Excellent question. We, we, there were the former prophets and the latter prophets. What do all the prophets have in common? They all believe that God was somehow speaking through them. So all the former prophets, people in the first few books of the Bible, even Abraham is referred to as prophet, even Moses is referred to as a prophet. Okay, somehow God was speaking through them to the people. How interesting. We have this, this tradition of God speaking through, of people believing that God is speaking through them. Which is why today we say that we're baptized priests, prophets, and kings. What does that mean when we celebrate baptism this coming Saturday and we baptize a young person, a prophet, meaning God can speak through that child as much as God can speak through anyone in this room. Andy? I've heard it said that that without the prophets, we wouldn't have a mythical world like we have today. We wouldn't have justice like we have today. We wouldn't have humanity. wouldn't have advanced to the point that it has because when the prophet saw an injustice, it was like God told him, go tell that king, to straighten that out, you know. So let's think about that claim for a moment. Without the prophets, what would the prophets do? If Andy comes to us, we're now primitive people now. We don't have any of the laws that we have today. We're just trying to get along here. And Andy comes along and says, God told me that we should do this. God told me that we should treat one another with respect. Okay, that's a big claim, Andy. I know, All this I know what you would do. Man, you go throw, for it. throw me to the lions just the way it did. What, was it Daniel or somebody? It depends. So for some of us, if I'm the big bully in the room who's been bullying everyone else in the room, then I'm probably not going to hear that I need to treat you with respect. 
If I'm the one who's being bullied, then I'm probably going to say, yay, Andy. Right? <laughs> Follow me? So how interesting the prophets are going to be claiming to speak to us on God's behalf and say, the Lord, the Lord says that we should do this. Which is going to make us turn, start training people because Andy says, the Lord says this. Okay? Becky says, the Lord says this. Okay? Now which one is right? Andy or Becky? Andy says the temple is going to fall in Jerusalem. Becky says it's not. Who's right? Becky. <laughs> For us, it's waiting to see. The temple is still standing. If it falls, Andy's right. If it doesn't, Becky's right. It's just a matter of timing because... It's a matter of time. Yeah, once the Babylonians left without destroying it, you know, and then somebody else comes and then they destroy it. So That's right. That's right. She was right one time and I was right one time. <laughs> And so do you see the challenge when people start saying that God is, that they're getting messages from God? Wait a minute. How do you start testing prophets? How do you know that one prophet is right or that another prophet is wrong? One is true or one is false? Vincent? So basically, going back to like you were just using the example of bullying and saying, yeah, there's one bully and one prophet is talking about the laws. So it's basically of having faith and believe in that one prophet, all coming together to that one prophet to overcome that one bully. It's going to be interesting because there are going to be people who believe the prophets, there are going to be people who be people don't believe the prophets, and then when we start getting two prophets in the community, Andy versus Becky, what's that going to mean for us? We have to choose. Who are we with? Are we with Andy? Or are we with Becky? Or are we going off and saying that God is talking to us instead? Leads us into some dangerous grounds. Persians, so that we understand what's going on at this time, the Persians are going to support the Jerusalem cult because essentially they want us to organize ourselves. They want us to be successful because the more successful we are as a people, what does that mean for taxes? Right? It means money for them. So the better off we are, if we organize this system with monies coming into the temple, that's all good news, because that means that we're raising the revenues to be able to help support the Persian army. Cyrus could not be happier. And so if we come up with this system of, let's call it tithes, have we heard that before? If we were to come up with a system of tithes where everyone has to pay 10% to the temple, is Cyrus going to be opposed to that? Because we're establishing our temple treasury, out of which... We're going to be paying our tributes. So, the challenge is, now that we're coming back to Jerusalem, many people are seeing this as a sign of how it is that God is, being, is looking on us with favor and is using Cyrus as an instrument and how it is that God is stepping in to be able to do these things. So Jeremiah, for instance, has this idea of how it is that a righteous branch is going to be springing up. Even Isaiah had this image of how it was that a shoot would sprout from the stump of Jesse. Do you remember that image? What is a stump? A stump is when a tree's been cut off, cut down. What's, what happens when a shoot comes out of the stump? It's a sign of new life. It looked dead, it was a stump, but then a shoot comes out of it. What does that mean? It's coming back. Those were images like that that the prophets used. So Jeremiah speaks of a righteous branch whose name is Yahweh our righteousness. And perhaps that was a pun on Zedekiah. Zedekiah's name literally means Yahweh is my righteousness. <coughs> so how it is that we hear we have these images of how it is that this stump has been cut down, but how it is that something's going to come up out of it, new life is coming up out of it. Jeremiah speaks of a Davidic king, how it is that now that we're back in Jerusalem, we're going to be reestablishing not only the temple, but also our monarchy. Deutero Isaiah speaks of a servant. Going back to the Andy-Becky conflict, part of the challenge we're going to have during this time is how do we judge between the true prophets and the false prophets, between conflicting revelations, if they're both saying different things, who's right, who's wrong. And because of that, largely, the institution of prophecy is going to begin to collapse. Because we're going to be looking at Andy and we're going to be looking at Becky, and though we love them, we're going to be saying, you know, this is just creating a lot of division in our community. We used to live as one happy family, until Andy started claiming to have revelations from God. And then we started to listen to Andy. And then Becky started claiming to have revelations from God. Now any one of us could start claiming to have revelations from God. How do we judge that? 
Jerusalem, our city, was identified with Sodom in, prof in prophetic diatribes. We remember Abraham's dialogue over the fate of Zodom, Sodom. Abraham says to God, God, if there are 40 righteous people in Sodom, will you destroy the city of Sodom? God says, if there are 40 people, I will not destroy the city. What if there are only 30 people? If there are only 30 people, righteous people in Sodom, will you destroy it? If you can show me 30 righteous people, I won't destroy it. Remember that conversation in the book of Genesis? That may have been a late addition, essentially talking about the crisis that we were having in Jerusalem. Here is this city of Jerusalem. If Jerusalem is a righteous city, if there are 40 righteous people, would God allow the city to fall? What if there are only 30? What if there are only one? If there are only one righteous person in Jerusalem, would God allow Jerusalem to be destroyed on account of that one good person? Follow me? So when we start writing stories like we have in the book of Genesis, how interesting that those stories may have less to do with Abraham and more to do with what was going on in our city at the time that we were writing down these stories. Follow me? So how interesting. Abraham addresses issues that are pertinent right before and right after the fall of Jerusalem. So the story of this man, Abraham, some 1,200 years before, roughly 1800 B.C., how it is that we're, we have this story that's talking about things that are happening in the 6th century B.C. Would God allow Jerusalem to be destroyed if there were righteous people living there? Would God allow that? Jeremiah suggested that if there's, a, if there's even only one righteous person in the city, God will not destroy it. Ezekiel argued that only the righteous could save only themselves, Think about that for a moment. That's a different argument. Jer Jeremiah said, if there's even one righteous person, God won't destroy the city. Ezekiel is more individualistic, simply meaning, if there's a good person or two in the city, Deacon on Halitha and Janey, good people, they'll be saved. The rest of the city, kiss it goodbye. So Genesis chapter 18 and the book of Job, they may have been inspired by the same situation. Both Abraham and Job know that they have no right to question God, but they do so anyways. They confess that they're dust and ashes. You read both stories like this side by side, Genesis and Job, and it's like, wait a minute, it's like they're written by people with the same ideas, likely during the same time period. Both raise questions about how God can destroy the righteous. And so it simply seems for us, since this is a course on prophecy and prophets, that what was happening before of prophets saying and doing the things that they were doing, we're no longer listening to prophets in the same way. They're no longer meeting our needs. So, um, this kind of goes back to my question, I think last week or week before, about um, God and like, the capacity of God and how can God destroy the righteous? Destroy the righteous? Like, when there's a presence of one righteous person and then Ezekiel saying that he the righteous. The righteous really save themselves. How do I think more about that? The fancy word that we use for that is theodicy, which simply means how can God allow evil in this world and how, how does God deal with evil? Just because there's one evil person in our midst, what does God do about that? Why does God allow that? to happen. Why does God allow evil, like that person, to affect good people like us? And what does God do as a result of that? Does God somehow punish that person? Or does God somehow punish all of us? And how is it that God allows us to be punished by evil people and evil things? How could God allow our city and our temple to be destroyed? How does God allow that? How could God allow six million Jews to die in the Holocaust? Where is God in all that? That's the question of theodicy. How does God, why does God allow evil? If you believe in a good God, what does that say for the presence of evil in the world? I have a feeling we're not going to solve that question this evening. Andy? You know, is it possible that the bad that happens in Austin, Texas, or in any place, happens in part because the rest of us that go to church on Sunday and all that allow it to happen in a way with our thoughts. In other words, we want to make money for us. 
you know, we want stuff for us. We pray and we pray and we pray for us, you know, for our success and all that. And we're just not praying enough for for others, for the people that uh, are not going to enjoy Thanksgiving, you know, that they, they, they need it. You know, they, they need to prosper. They need jobs. They need other things. And I believe that a lot of the crimes, murders, or whatever that are going to happen, they're because the rest of us, without trying, allow it to happen. It certainly makes us ask questions of, is there not something that we can be doing about these things? Since the 1960s, we've called it social sin, right? If there's any situation like that that happens in the world, pride, then it rightly causes us to ask, what are we doing about these things? If there's hunger in Austin, then all of us are responsible. If there's homelessness in this world, we're all responsible. Yeah. Our, our thoughts are responsible, you know, in large part, I think. But can you determine that with an individuality? Because one of this is in, in your individuality, you're saying a good God, you do go pray, you do go to church, but something happens to you individually. But you can look at it individually or social. There you go. Same with sin, right? We can reflect on sin. There are my individual sins, those things that I do, but there are also our social sins, those things that we do. It seems that certain social sins include things like hunger and homelessness and war.